Hi everyone, welcome back to Game Maker Cast. It's Mickey, and in this video, we're going to be combining structs, arrays, and the tile map to store data in each individual cell. What this means is we'll be able to play different sounds when our player walks on the tiles, and also each tile can have their own health before being destroyed. There's just so much more the system opens up. To get started, download the project found in the description below. If you're looking for the text version of this video or the full source code to this and many others, check out my Patreon site, which again is also in the description. Now I do have the sample project loaded in front of me, and this is everything that we're going to need in order to get started. Just a quick recap of what's actually contained in the project is we currently have an initialization room, and this is where we're going to take care of all of our global variables. This just allows us to easily access the tile map anywhere within our system. I've also created a 32 by 32 tile set, and the art, I must say, is quite amazing. And that's actually everything we're going to need, so let's close this and open up the object in it game. In here, we're going to create a new event, and let's maximize this. Now this object is going to be used for any main game initializations. I briefly talked about this, but this is where we're going to set up our global variables and the tile map information. I want to make sure that we store the tile map size. And this grid size is going to allow us to convert our X and Y positions into positions on the grid. And we're also going to be storing the grid width and the grid height. Right now, I'm going to set these to zero, and we're doing this because we can dynamically load the grid through different rooms. Finally, I'm going to make a variable for the grid itself, and in the end, this is going to be what we're actually going to be using. Right now, I'm just going to leave it as undefined so we can come back and we can load it up later. Now, because this is an initialization object, the final thing I want to do is just go to the different room. Now let's make sure that we have this object in our room. Let's open up the initialization room and just drag and drop it into the game. Now besides having an initialization for the game itself, I also like to have one for the rooms. This object is going to contain everything we need to have an individual room set up, whether it's the actual room or a test room, everything is going to go inside here. Let's open up the create event and add a few things. The first thing we're going to need to do is grab a reference to our tile map layer. If you're unfamiliar where this tile map layer comes from, if we go into the main room, you can see that over here in the inspector panel, we actually have a tiles layer right here. This is the one that we're going to be using, so that's where it comes from. Now that we're storing a reference in the variable, we can easily fill in the tile map width and height by using the function tile map get width and tile map get height. And now that we know the width and height of our tile map for this room, we can go ahead and initialize our grid by using the ds grid create command. We'll pass in the width and height as well. Now that we have everything set up, we're going to change to the hard part of this tutorial. Basically, what we need to do is loop through the entire tile map that exists in our room. And then depending on which tile index we find, we're going to store some of the information. This information could be hit points, a name, could be sounds, and so on. Now, it doesn't really sound that hard, and trust me, it really isn't. First, let's start off with a simple for loop. We're going to loop through until we get to the end of the grid width. Now, we can copy this for loop and just paste it in, and let's change the variable to j, and we'll also loop through to the grid height. Our next step is going to be grabbing each individual tile at that current position of i and j. Now that we have the individual tile, we're going to use a big switch statement here. The switch statement is basically going to ask us what kind of tile is it? Is this going to be a sand tile, a dirt tile, or a stone tile? Then, depending on which tile it actually falls under, we can store the different information. For instance, if it's going to be a sand tile itself, what we could do is we could say ds grid set. We'll pass in the global grid in the position of i and j, which actually matches the for loop. Next, we're going to add a new struct inside of this grid. The struct is going to contain, say, the tile index, so which tile it actually is. We'll contain a name, and we'll set this one to sand. Let's also have some hit points. And finally, let's actually use a sound, and we're going to set this to snd underscore sand. Now, with this information, all we really have to do is go through each individual tile and set it up. 
So you can see here, I currently have the tiles index one, two, and three. And so let's go through the code and actually add them. All I really need to do here is copy and paste my case statement. And for this one, it's gonna be a case number of two. So that's the tile index. We'll make sure that we're gonna name it dirt. And let's set the hit points to two and also update the sound. Now we'll do the same for the tile index of three, except this one's gonna be stone and it also has a different hit points and sound. Now with that all done, we need to make sure that nothing's going to crash. We kind of need to have a special use case if our tile index doesn't fall between these numbers. So what we can do is we can just copy the case for number three, and we'll change the case statement to the word default. So that means if nothing else happens between these numbers, it's gonna come down to this one. We'll update the tile index, the hit points, the name of the tile, and we'll set the sound to no one. Now let's actually switch to the main room and add this object in. Before we close the room, let's draw something nice in our room. We'll go over to the inspector, click on the tiles, and now we can draw using that tile set. Let's create a little bit for the sand. We'll choose the dirt and we'll add some here. And then we'll create something for the stone. So with the art done, we can actually close this. And now the one thing we need to do is we need to have something that monitors our grid and updates it. Over in the assets, we should already have an object grid manager. Let's open it up and add a new create event. Let's also add an alarm event for alarm zero. Inside the create event, we just need to have a reference to our tile map and we've already done this before. Next, I'm gonna tell the manager to update the grid every time we are about one-tenth of a second. Since we're using alarms, let's go into the alarm zero event. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do the same thing as we just did. We'll cycle through the entire grid. And like I said, we've done this before. So we'll just use the for loop for the grid width and a for loop for the grid height. Now, instead of grabbing the each individual tile, what we're gonna do is grab the element from the grid itself. So we'll use a variable called element and we will use the DS grid get function and we'll pass in the grid and also our positions for I and J. Now we can check if the element's hit points are less or equal to zero. And if it is, then what we wanna do is update that cell to an empty cell. So what we'll do is we'll change the element name to empty We'll change the dig sound to no one, and then we'll change the element tile to zero. Finally, we're gonna update the tile map to the correct tile itself. So basically, anytime that the hit points are less than zero, we're gonna go through and change the name, the sound, the tile, and then we're gonna update the tile map to be reflective. Now right now, this isn't really going to do anything if we run our game. We need a way to actually interact with this. And for that, we're gonna be using the object mouse. So let's go ahead and open up the object mouse and let's add a new event. We'll add a step event and we'll also add a create event. In the create event, we're gonna create a new variable called element. This is just gonna be the selected element that exists from our global dot grid. We'll switch over to the step event and let's check to see if we're gonna be pressing any of our mouse buttons. If we have pressed one of the mouse buttons, we need to transfer the mouse coordinates to the grid coordinates. We can easily do this by taking our mouse position, such as the mouse X position, and dividing it by the global dot grid size that we set in the beginning. We'll copy and paste this and do the same for the Y component. Now that we have the grid position, let's get the element within our grid by using the DS grid get function. This will get a specific element and put it as our variable, thus giving us access to the struct and everything that we created originally. Now let's check to see if the hit points are bigger than zero. I also wanna add a check to see if we have a valid sound by checking that the dig sound is not equal to no one. Finally, if everything passes, we can just play the sound according to the block that we selected. And last but not least, let's remove a hit point from this block for every click. I also want you to notice that we don't need to write back the element to the grid because when we use the DS grid function, it returned a reference to that particular struct. 
Thus, no writing back is needed, it's automatically updated. Now, with that all done, let's switch back to the object in it room and scroll all the way down to the bottom. We need to add the two new objects into this room initialization. For this, we'll both use the instance create depth. We don't really care about the X and Y positions or the depth. We just need to ensure that we are using the object manager and the object mouse. The other thing that I like to do with initializations is just clean it up. I don't need this object sitting in the room, so I'm just gonna remove it at the very end. So now when our game runs, we're gonna switch to the main room and it's gonna load in everything and then load in the manager and load in the mouse. So let's see what happens when we run this. We can see that we have a bunch of debugging information and this is actually just coming from the draw event that I left in. There's nothing much in here. We're just getting the element and then displaying it on the screen. But in here, if I click, you should be able to hear that we're playing a different sound. Well, it looks like we have a small issue with our grid manager. So let's actually close this and switch back to that. If I go to the alarm event, you can see that we're basically going through the loop, but we're not resetting that alarm. So inside the alarm zero event, we need to reset it by calling the alarm set again. When we run this game, you can start clicking on the tiles and you can see that the tiles start changing. They are playing different sounds depending on which tile is clicked, and it's also updating the name to an empty tile when it gets deleted. You can use this in your game itself, and the nice part about this is it actually works with the default collision within GameMaker. So it's actually super helpful if you wanted to create your own kind of collision. You could have the player go through and dig down, and the collision would automatically happen for you. Anyway, that brings this tutorial to an end. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video. A special shout out to everyone who is supporting this channel through subscribing or on Patreon. If you want the full source code to this video and many others, including applications, follow the Patreon link found in the description. A special shout out to these Patreon supporters in no particular order. Patrick, Sean, Emerald, Helna, 39 Digits, Sido, Mika, Matthew, Midnight, Game Maker Community, GGB84, and Victor. Again, thank you all for your continued support. Keep an eye on the posts under the community tab for more updates on what's coming up.